Thanks for having me, Dee. Um, and thanks, Lori, um, for the reminder that I will also say that State Policy Network um, is a nonpartisan nonprofit. And so um, while we're discussing kind of what's going on in the public sphere right now, I'd just like to put that out before we start. We, so State Policy Network operates with, um, as Dee mentioned, a network of state-based organizations that work on, on uh, working on policy in the states that make positive changes for people living in those states. And so a lot of the work that our groups do end up being more state than federally focused. And we took a look at Georgia as an example of why some of the really important decisions that voters will be making in November um, might be overshadowed by some of the media hype on what's going on at the federal level. Georgia becomes a great example of this. D, as you mentioned, it's been in the news in terms of electoral politics um, over the last couple of presidential cycles. You have a really high visibility governor's race. You have a high visibility Senate race. And the Senate race in particular is getting a lot of attention because it's a little bit closer than the governor's race. But if you look at it in the context of what, what does a vote either way mean for the people living in Georgia and the services they need um, to live good, healthy, happy, productive lives, um, the, the race in Georgia going either way, at the end of the day, the Senate's probably still going to be somewhere between 49 and 53 Democrats um, is what most of the projections are showing. I would recommend Nate Silver's projections. They're pretty good and updated really frequently. Um, but so what does that mean in terms of what happens for people in Georgia? Considering that the House is likely to, to go to the Republicans, probably nothing. The general... Uh, can, the general wisdom right now is that not a lot is going to get done in Washington. If you contrast that at the state level, where, again, you have a contested governor's race, and that obviously has a major impact on what happens in the state, but all of the state legislative seats in Georgia are up in 2022, and 20% of them are open. 20% of those seats have um, an incumbent that's retiring. So they how, are How unusual is that, Erin? Um, I, I haven't I haven't looked kind of long term at the trends. Um, whether it's unusual or not, it's a massive opportunity if you think about a twenty yeah. percent turnover. And then you look at the the context of what happened in the Georgia legislative session last year. So you had um, an increase in their school choice program by twenty percent from one hundred million dollars to one hundred and twenty million dollars. Um, at the same time, you had a universal school choice bill fail, largely because of political infighting. And again, that's the sort of thing that voters look at, whether they're for or against whatever's um, being considered in the state house and say, that's, you know, that's not acceptable, um, the way that this was handled, and I'm going to hold my elected officials accountable. Um, and the universal school choice bill, had it not been for some of this political drama behind the scenes, is something that very easily could have passed in the state. Um, you contrast that with what has been able to be accomplished at the federal level on education. Really what that is, is that the federal government gave the states a lot of money post COVID to deal with COVID learning loss that the states actually haven't been able to spend. So there is so much federal money flowing in to the states specifically for education that the federal government had to extend the deadline by which the states had to spend the money because they couldn't spend the money. Um, if you contrast that, um, I'll put the link in the chat, but not just in Georgia, um, there's an organization called Education Commission of the States. It's um, funded in part by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but they track all of the different legislation that's happening at the state level on education. And I mean, there's way too much for me to mention in the time that I have here. But the point is, is that things are happening at the states. And these are elections that are also happening in the midterms um, that it, at the end of the day, probably have more of an impact on what happens to people's lives um, than, than some of the bigger races that are getting media hype. 
Um, it's obviously important what happens in Washington and who is in those seats. Um, but th the idea that everything hinges on one or two Senate races really ignores the fact that the states can and will do a lot at the local at a more local level. Um, and increasingly, you have a Supreme Court that is encouraging them to do more at the local level. So I think, especially in the next two years, you're going to see a lot more happening at the state level and groups that are involved in public policy um, or want to influence public policy are probably going to be more successful at that level than they are at the federal level. So the uh, there were kind of two pieces there. So one is that we have been doing quite a bit of work to dig into this idea of divided America. Um, and the more that we look at it, the more it seems like a lot of that is media narrative. So we have political disagreements as a country. We have very strong political disagreements as a country. But there's a lot of evidence that says the values, the things that we hold dear to us are the same and have been the same. Um, that's kind of the whole idea on how the country was founded, that we have common values that bring us together um, while different groups, regions, colonies, states, whatever you wanna kind of paint the picture of um, 250 years ago, um, had very different ideas about politics and what mattered in the day-to-day -day life. And so the degree to which we can kind of remind people and push back against this almost self-fulfilling prophecy narrative of like, oh, you know, 60% of Americans think we're about to, you know, go into the next civil war. Um, we believe that pushing back against that idea is really important to make sure people remember that we have more in common than not and to not get caught up in some of the drama surrounding that and instead focus on fixing the problems where the problems are best fixed. Um, so then to get to your second point, um, you know, I think the clue is in our name that a lot of where the progress can be made is at the states. And you're seeing that, I, you know, Lori, I completely agree on some of the economic issues and how the current situation is really impacting people in a way that is not reflected in the headlines, that's not reflected in the um the election coverage, and there are a lot of stories to tell out there. There are also a lot of stories to tell about how states are stepping up in the absence of federal action that I think the country is used to, but has increasingly been shown to be ineffective. So there's some really interesting polling out there on the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. Um, that shows most people, including a majority of Democrats, um, who are, but they don't actually believe it's going to reduce inflation. They don't actually believe it's going to get the make the economy better. Um, and you contrast that with some things that states are doing that are, you know, from a from a narrative or a media perspective, like kind of boring. Um, you know, they're they're updating zoning regulations so that housing supply can can increase, which will help um, with some of the just completely outlandish um, costs of housing and costs of living, especially in cities. Um, you've got people, you've got states looking at cutting levels of bureaucracy that make it hard and time consuming to start businesses. A lot of like very red tape, like bureaucratic regulation reform that ultimately is going to impact the economy um, and impact the economy at that most local level where people really need the help. So those are some of the things that we're seeing and some of the things that we're working on right now. I mean, as, as grim as it is, I think I would probably agree with that assessment that a major recession is coming. Um, you're seeing the beginnings of it in Europe, especially as we head into the winter, and they're in a much different energy situation than we are, but it's definitely going to bleed over. Um, it's impact on being able to get things done. That's tricky. Um, so usually I would say you get into a period um, of economic turmoil where the average American needs help. And the government has been, the federal government has been pretty quick to act. And that's true at the state level as well, right? That's, Every that's what happened during coronavirus. I mean, we had unprecedented level bipartisan support for major legislative action. 
Yeah, so that's true. <laughs> I feel like that has set the stage, though, for more of a fight the next time around because of the fallout from that. So there's a lot um, there's a lot of data that indicates that part of the reason we're in this really high period of inflation is because of the amount of government spending that happened during COVID. Um, everybody's quick to point the finger at whoever they don't like that they took a, a PPP loan. Um, here are people that didn't pay it back. Never mind the fact they were designed not to be paid back. Um, right? There's just a lot of political damage that came from that. And so I think you're going to see a little bit more resistance from people kind of on the further right side of things to say, hey, no, the government shouldn't be spending money. And those are probably going to be people that are pretty secure in their seats either way, right? The, the members that are winning their races with 70, 80% of vote. So, you know, will you see if things get really bad, will you see some action at the federal level? You'll probably see something because most, most of the people in Washington, their jobs depend on it. Um, but I would not be surprised to see a larger, louder contingent of people pushing back against that. Um, at the state level, you're probably still going to see some things. Um, for those of you in the state of Virginia, I was not aware we were getting a tax rebate, but apparently those dropped this week. Um, and so some of that, yeah, D check. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so there is I, I do think you will see some of that at the state level as well, but there, um, I think there's going to be some caution on that given, given this most recent period of inflation. And again, just some of the nasty political messaging that came out of the last round of, of government spending to stimulate the economy. I can give my thoughts, which is um, <clears throat> basically we don't know. Um, so there are certain, there are certain changes that help or that have traditionally helped the Democrats. There are other changes that have traditionally helped the Republicans. Um, when you look across the 50 states, you've just had so much change and updating of the laws because of COVID in 2020. And this is the first major cycle election since those laws went into place. So will people vote early and via mail and Dropbox in the same at, at the same levels that they did when we were really at the height of the pandemic? Probably not. Um, but, you know, a lot of behavior changes when you use technology to update the way that that things have always been done. Um, so I look at this year as some expectation setting for 2024. Um, I'm sure there are people who have looked at it more in depth than I have and probably have more thoughts about it. Um, but I'm I'm not sure I would be surprised by much in terms of how those numbers come out, but use that as more of a norm, new normal uh, going forward. Um, so I think there's a, I think like many things that are technical in nature, but have been distilled down for a general audience that there's a lot in a single poll that it might project, hey, this person is ahead by a lot, or um, you know, here is going to be the clear winner, and that some of the details might not get translated as much. Any individual poll, especially when you're looking at at horse races, right at, at the ballot, um, you know, there's there's a certain degree of error, and people change their minds that that means it's always a little fluid. And any more now that we're in a situation where most races are within like three to four points, it's really hard to use a single poll um, to understand what's going on. So I'm not sure that it's a miss as much as people like to, to hit at it on a, as a miss. Um, we don't get involved in elections. I mean, we look at it because it helps, um, we, it helps us gauge the mood of people and what's important to them. Um, but we don't really do any of that ballot test polling. Um, where polling is still incredibly effective, even if there is a little bit of noise, is understanding some of these broader issues, right? What are the issues that are most important to people? How do they feel about compromise? How are, where are their emotions? Are they worried? Are they optimistic? Um, and that stuff is really reliable and can often, with historical clues, give you a good sense as to what's going to happen. If, 
if you look at some of the most successful presidential polling, like forecasting, the models that's, that are done in, in more of the academic space, um, almost all of them have kind of mood of the country view of the economy in as some of the key variables. Um, so if you can understand where people are on that, you can get a good sense of where things are going. Um, so yeah, that that's my, but I mean, you know, I have a polling background, so I'm always going to defend. defend. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you the ones that would be big surprises. I just don't think they're, I don't know if they're going to happen or not. Um, <laughs> I think when you get, so when you get a little bit further past the election and you get deep into the analysis, I think one of the most interesting things is going to be the shifting Latino vote. Um, so there's been a lot, a lot of work done on that, a lot of back and forth really on how that vote looks, really going back as far as 2016 and then the change from 16 to 20 and, and how that's going to move forward, especially with the economy. Um, as kind of the number one issue, but that that is the stuff I think I'm probably most interested in digging into um, come November 9th. 